Mr Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that this House has considered the subject of money creation and society. The methods of money production in society today are profoundly corrupting in ways which would matter to everyone if they were clearly understood. The essence of this debate uh, is who should be allowed to create money, how and at whose risk. One of the most memorable quotes about money and banking is usually attributed to Henry Ford. He said, uh, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Well, let's hope we don't have a revolution, Mr Speaker, because I feel sure we're all Conservatives on this side. How's it done? Well, the process is so simple, the mind is repelled. Whenever a bank <coughs> makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. Many times I've been told that this is ridiculous, even by one employee who'd previously worked for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation of the United States. The explanation is actually taken from the Bank of England article, Money Creation in the Modern Economy. It seems to me rather hard to dismiss. Uh, we're in a debt crisis of historic proportions because for far too long profit-maximising banks have been lending money into existence as debt with too few effective restraints on their conduct and all the risks of doing so forced upon the taxpayer by the power of the state. Now, thankfully, the institution of money is a human social institution and it can be changed. It has been changed and I believe it should be changed further. Even before QE began, we lived in an era of chronic uh, inflation, monetary inflation, unprecedented in the industrial age. Uh, between uh, 91 and 2009, the money supply increased fourfold. It tripled between 97 and 2010, from £700 billion to £2.2 trillion, accelerating into the crisis. Now, you just cannot increase the money supply at this rate without profound consequences. They are the consequences which are with us today. Just to return to where I wanted to go, where did all this money that was created as debt go? Well, when I look at the sectoral lending uh, figures, I see that some went into um, commercial property, there were some went into personal loans, credit cards and so on. Actually, the rise in, of lending into real productive businesses, excluding the financial sector, was relatively moderate. But overwhelmingly, where this new debt went was into mortgages and into the financial sector. But the point I'm making is this. If a great fountain of new money gushes up into the financial sector, we should not be surprised that we find that the banking system is far wealthier than anybody else. We shouldn't be surprised if financings, housing, uh, London and the South East are far wealthier than anywhere else. Indeed, I remember when QE began, when QE began, house prices started rising in Chiswick and Islington. The point is this, Mr Speaker, that money is not neutral. It redistributes real income from, from uh, later to earlier owners, that is, from the poor to the rich on the whole. Now, this distribution effect is key to understanding the effect of new money on society. I think it's the primary cause of almost all conflicts revolving about the, uh, around the production of money, the relations between uh, creditors and debtors. Now, given that, I think it raises the question at the heart of this debate. I mean, who should create the money? Uh, and I just ask this question. Would Parliament ever have voted to delegate power to create money to those same banks that caused the horrendous financial crisis from which the world is still suffering? I think the answer to that is unambiguously no. Now, against that background, there are solid grounds, I think, for examining, and this is where I do come to my proposal, uh, the creation of a sovereign monetary system, as recommended by several expert commentators recently. Uh, Martin Wolf, uh, who, as everyone uh, in this House will know, is an influential chief economics commentator of the FT, uh, wrote an article a few months ago, on the 24th of April, to be precise, entitled Strip Private Banks of Their Power to Create Money. This is from Martin Wolf, recommending switching from bank-created debt to a nationalised money supply. Also, Lord Adair Turner, who was a former chair of the Financial Services Authority, uh, delivered a speech uh, about 18 months ago in February 2013 discussing an alternative uh, to quantitative easing, 
uh, which he turned overt money finance, uh, which is also known as a form of sovereign money. Now, such a system, and here I will describe its main outline, such a system would restrict the power to create all money to the state via the central bank. Changes to the rules governing how banks operate would still permit them to make loans, but would make it impossible for them to create new money in the process. The central bank would continue to follow the remit uh, set by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, which is currently to deliver price stability, which is defined at the present time uh, as inflation target of 2%. The central bank would be exclusively responsible for creating as much new money as was necessary to support non-inflationary growth. Decisions on money creation would be taken independently of government uh, by a newly formed uh, monetary creation committee or by the existing uh, monetary policy committee, either of which would be accountable uh, to the Treasury Select Committee. And I think that uh, accountability to the House is crucial to this whole process. Now, I conclude that I believe a sovereign monetary system offers a very considerable advantage over the present system. Uh, it would create a better and safer banking system because banks would have an incentive to take lower levels of risk since there would be no option of a bailout or rescue from taxpayers and thus moral hazard uh, would be reduced. Second, it would increase economic stability uh, because money creation by banks tends to be pro-cyclical, uh, as I've explained, whereas money creation by the central bank would be counter-cyclical. Thirdly, sovereign money crucially supports the real economy when under the current system, 83% of lending does not at the moment go into productive investment. I underline that three times. So for all of these reasons, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe that the examination of the merits uh, of, sovereign, of a sovereign monetary system is now urgently needed, and I would call on the government to set up a commission on money and credit with particular reference to the potential benefits of sovereign money which offers a way out of the continuing and worsening financial crises that have blighted this country and indeed the whole international economy for decades. This is an issue that has not been debated for well over a century and I think we wouldn't be having this debate if it wasn't for the fact that we are uh, still in the midst of tumultuous times. We had the banking crash, we had the corresponding crash in confidence in the banking system and in the wider economy. And now we have a problem of, of, of underlending, partly as a consequence, particularly to small and medium-sized business. So this could not be more important. And the member for, uh, my, my, I'm going to say my honourable friend, because we work on many issues together, for Alderman Roynton, uh, uh, pointed out at the beginning of his speech that, that this is an issue that is not well understood by members of the public. Well, and I think he could, was mentioned later on in his speech, but if he didn't, I'm going to add that this is an issue which is also not well understood by members of this House, by members of Parliament. Um, and, and I would include myself in that, and I suspect most people here would be humble enough to recognise that this is such a complex issue, this banking wizardry we're discussing today, that very few people really properly understand it. And if, if members of Parliament don't really understand how money is created, and I really believe that is the majority position, certainly based on discussions I have been having. How on earth can we be confident that the reforms we brought in over the course of the last few years are going to work, are going to prevent repeat, repeat, repeat collapse of the sort which we saw before the last election? And, and my, my view is that we can't be confident. So I think these issues need to be explored, and I think it is time for a monetary commission to be established and for Parliament then to become much more engaged than we have been. This is a very small step in that direction. I'm very grateful to the sponsors of today's debate. This, I mean, this debate obviously comes following a significant campaign by Positive Money, who have been raising some extremely important issues about how we ensure financial stability 
or how we as parliamentarians and indeed how members of the public can gain a far greater understanding of the way in which our economy works and in particular how money is supplied. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Oldham for his uh, good explanation of the positive money agenda, which is certainly an, an idea worthy of thought, and I will come on to that. So um, I want to start by saying money creation is a very important and complex aspect of our economy that I do agree with members is very often misunderstood. But first, I just want to briefly set out why we don't believe that the right solution is the wholesale replacement of the current system by something else such as a sovereign monetary system. Under a sovereign monetary system it would be the state, not banks, creating new money. The central bank via a committee would decide how much money is created and this money would mostly be transferred to the government. Lending would come from the pool of customers' investment account deposits held by commercial banks. Such a system would raise a number of very important <laughs> questions. How would that committee assess how much money should be created to meet the inflation target and support the economy? If the central bank had the power to finance government's policies, what would the implications be for the credibility of the fiscal framework and the government's ability to borrow from the market if it needed to? What would be the impact on the availability of credit for businesses and households? Wouldn't credit become very pro-cyclical? Wouldn't we incentivise financing households over businesses? Because in the case of businesses, banks would presumably expect the state to step in. Wouldn't we be encouraging the emergence of an unregulated set of new shadow banks? And wouldn't the introduction of a totally new system, untested across modern advanced economies, create unnecessary risk at a time when what people need is stability? So in conclusion, this government's belief is that the current system, modified and improved with far greater competition, is the one that will serve the economy best.